welcome to the Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series provided by the Royal Tyrrell Museum Cooperating Society. Today, our speaker is Professor David Polly of the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Indiana University. Um, although a specialist on the evolution of mammals, um, uh, Professor Polly is going to talk to us on something slightly adjacent to that uh, today. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to David uh, to give him as much time as possible and we'll deal with your questions at the end. Over to you, David. All right, thank you, Jeff, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, I am going to talk to you about the, the long and continuing saga of Grand Staircase Escalante and Bears Ears National Monuments in the United States, uh, which I think probably most of you here know. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you about the, the two national monuments in Utah that were um, cut down by um, President Donald Trump and the reasons behind that and what's happened since then. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today um, are um, the geology and paleontology of these two monuments, um, a little bit about the Cretaceous Revolution, which is one of the scientific impacts of um, Grand Staircase. So I'll just sort of gloss through that since I think most of the people who are attending this um, likely know more about that than I do. Um, but then sort of come around to the to the politics and the mechanics and the the legalities of of what happened including what is a national monument um what exactly got cut when mr trump made his cuts why does it matter to paleontologists because um, among other things the society of vertebrate paleontology filed lawsuit um, to reverse those um what were the politics behind the cuts um what's happening with the lawsuits now and what's happening um, with their restoration, um, which happened recently by President Biden. Um, and you may well be familiar with um, these national monuments, but just in case you're not, um, the areas that we're talking about are outlined here in yellow. Um, they are both in the state of Utah, um, and you can see they're actually a pretty sizable chunk of the state of Utah. Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument um, that's sort of towards the left of the two, established in 1996 by President Bill Clinton, and Bears Ears National Monument um, established only in 2016 by um, in the last months of President Barack Obama's administration. And both of these pieces of land, this will come back um, toward the end, um, these national monuments were established by these two presidents by proclamation under the authority of the Antiquities Act, um, which is a piece of US legislation from 1906. Um, that is not exactly the same thing as national park um, national monuments as this um, text says um, the president may declare in the president's discretion um, by public proclamation historic landmarks historic and prehistoric structures and other objects of historic or scientific interest that are situated on land owned or controlled by the federal government to be national monuments um, and so there are a special um, kind of designation that a president can make to protect one of those kinds of structures, um, historic landmarks, etc., or objects of scientific interest. And the, the reason this um, story has a paleontological twist is that the scientific interest at both of these monuments, not that there aren't other interests, but the scientific interest is chiefly paleontological. Um, and here you see a nice reconstruction by um, James Coither of Lythronax um, chomping on a Diabloceratops, um, two um, organisms that were discovered at Grand Staircase Escalante. And in uh, 2017, December 2017, um, his first um, year in office, um, President Donald Trump um, slashed the size of these two national monuments by more than half. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and that same day, um, December 4th, 2017, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, along with a whole bunch of other plaintiffs, filed lawsuit against the Trump administration against those cuts, um, the reason being um, their, their scientific importance. And I got dragged into this, um, even though I had not worked in either of the two monuments because I happened to be president of the society at that time. Um, so I, that's that's sort of the background. Um, I'm going to um, sort of fill you in on 
um, the paleontology and geology at these monuments. And some of you may know a little bit about it, uh, but I'll give you a quick overview. Um, and here on geological time scale is, is roughly um, where these uh, monuments fit stratigraphically. Um, Bears Ears, um, an awful lot of it is the late Paleozoic and going into the early Mesozoic, um, though it does have some um, all the way up into the later Mesozoic. Um, and Grand Staircase is dominantly Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, um, although there is a little bit of Paleozoic in there as well as Quaternary um, in both of them. Um, so they're basically, um, their scientific story is um, the end of the end of um, terrestrial ecosystems um, of the Paleozoic before the Great Extinction, um, and then the evolution of ecosystems in the Mesozoic. Um, and if we go back and look at, at what the world was like um, at the time that that this sequence of um, deposition began, um, so in the Permian period, um, Utah was more or less on the west coast of um, the. Um, basically the continent of Pangaea, um, right up close to, but not exactly on the, the shores of the Panthalassic Ocean. Um, and through the course of the, the late Paleozoic and then through the Mesozoic, um, a lot of the, the western part of the continent got built up. Um, so by the end of the, um, the sequence in the late Cretaceous, um, that land is now far inland um, and on the shores of, of one of the interior seas. Um, so Bears Ears, um, if we look at it um, geologically, um, this is a color-coded geological map um, with Permian um, period. Um, the, um, if you're not familiar with the, the time, the division between Permian and Triassic is about 250 million years old. Um, so before the great extinction that happened at that time when um, some estimates have 95% of species became extinct, um, was the Permian period. Um, and a lot of bear's ears, um, as you can see over here on the map on the right, let me get my, there we go. Um, a lot of it is Permian in age. Um, there's some really fantastic um, sites there um, that are really telling the story of some of the first mature vertebrate ecosystems um, in North America. Um, then there's the extinction, and there's an, also an awful lot of Triassic um, scattered through here, um, which is um, documenting some of the recovery after that extinction. Um, and then some Jurassic and a little bit of Cretaceous at Bears Ears, and you see some of the kinds of uh, fossils that are preserved there. Um, I'll show you quickly just a few landscapes. Um, this is area in the southern part of Bears Ears called the Valley of the Gods, which is not so far from the Four Corners um, region, if you're familiar with that, uh, where New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, um, and Arizona meet. Um, and the Valley of the Gods um, is an area that was excluded uh, by Mr. Trump, um, but it has been um, worked for a long time for uh, looking at some of the Permian ecosystems. And this is a reconstruction um, from Frederick Spindler um, that was published by Houghton, Adam Hutenlocker et al. in 2018, um, which is a reconstruction of some of the ecosystems there um, at that time, including some um, synapsins and a, um, what looks to me like a Uriop sitting there in the front. Um, there's a Spinacodon, um, which is, I don't believe this particular specimen is from Bear's Ears, um, but um, this taxon and other um, early synapsids are very common there. Um, here's a really spectacular um, site. This is sort of in the northern part of Bears Ears um, in the Indian Creek area, also excluded. Um, that is essentially a late Paleozoic log jam. Um, and you can see some of the logs that have been excavated. Um, and this was um, sort of filling a river somewhere. And so um, caught inside of it are skeletons of all sorts of interesting vertebrates. Um, and then Triassic, um, a lot of the Triassic um, stuff at Bears Ears are trackways, um, like this pretty um, dramatic one. Um, this one, the, the artwork above is from Petrified National Forest, um, but the trackway that we're looking at is probably either the same animal or a very similar animal, um, also from Indian Creek area of Bears Ears, and also in an area that was excluded. Um, Grand Staircase, as I said, um, it's dominantly um, Mesozoic. Um, so we've got just a little bit of Permian um, down here, including the type area of the Kayabab Formation, which is a, a very widespread Western North American 
formation that crops out um, famously in the Grand Canyon, uh, but its type section is there. Um, there's some Triassic um, down over here and up here, um, sort of a big, um, two big faults through here um, that make for some interesting stratigraphy, but then we've got a lot of Jurassic um, and quite famously, um, probably the most famous part of Grand Staircase is the Kaiparowitz Plateau, um, which is where um, a very um, extraordinarily complete late Cretaceous sequence is found. And again, you see some of the, the kinds of fossils that have been found there. There's even some marine beds in here um, from that interior seaway um, in the late Cretaceous that um, that documents some of the ocean anoxic events. Um, and Grand Staircase, because it was um, established in 1996, it has been a national monument for a long time. So there has been a lot of paleontological work done there. Um, and pretty much all of the geological units um, at Grand Staircase contain scientifically important resources. Um, there are more than 3,000 scientifically important localities that have been identified. Um, and the Kaparowitz Formation, one of the, the most completely preserved Cretaceous ecosystems. And just a few pictures of the landscape. This is the Circle Cliffs area, um, which is way off to the east. Um, this is mostly Triassic um, that you're looking at there. A lot of it is Chinle Formation um, with some Moenkopi and, and other things in there. Um, this is a, a perhaps typical, but nevertheless spectacular um, skull. Of a, of a early early archosaur of some sort um, that is still under study. This is a Yale Peabody Museum specimen. Um, in that area at Circle Cliffs, there is one of the largest petrified forests, um, Triassic in age outside of petrified um, forest national park, one of the largest Triassic of North America petrified forest. Um, and here, uh, colleague standing next to one of the trunks of the trees in there. Um, pretty spectacular landscapes, um, but also um, geological deposits. Um, this landscape is carved out of um, some of the Jurassic um, sandstones, including the Navajo sandstone and others. Um, and you can see this road sneaking all the way through there. Um, just amazing landscapes. Um, and then the Kaparowitz um, Plateau has uh, late Cretaceous and just remarkably um, diverse faunas um, that have produced um, all, pretty much all the things you see in here. This is a reconstruction by Ra Raul Martin um, that he originally did for the Glen Canyon Natural History Association um, and graced the cover of um, a major research um, compendium that was edited by Alan Titus and Mark Lowen on the uh, Kaparowitz, um, mostly Kaparowitz formation, but uh, generally Kaparowitz plateau, the late Cretaceous sequence. Um, and in the Kaparowitz um, and its associated uh, members, um, John Henry and um, the Wall Weep, there have been a spectacular number of discoveries, including all of these dinosaurs, uh, many of them um, new, some of them um, also found in other places, many of them still under study. In fact, since uh, 2019, when this was produced, I think there's been a couple of others um, described, uh, which you'll see there's new pachycephalosaurs, new hypsilophodontids, et cetera, that are still under study. Um, there's one of the, the more dramatic um, finds there, Diabloceratops, or I don't know if it is the most dramatic, it's one of my favorites, I guess. Um, the type specimen of Diabloceratops, which is um, at the Utah Natural History Museum. And anybody who's been to that museum may have seen this really quite spectacular um, display on the wall of Ceratopsian phylogeny. Um, and several of these are new were newly discovered in Grand Staircase, Nasutoceratops, Diabloceratops, Utahceratops, Cosmoceratops, um, all Grand Staircase discoveries. Um, and the, the dinosaurs in many ways are, are the most famous um, things out of Grand Staircase and, and the most popular with kids. Um, but some of its real scientific importance comes from the fact that um, basically the entire ecosystem is preserved there. So they're um, are flowering plants, there's early mammals, there's early birds, um, crocodilians, lizards, amphibians, etc. cetera. Um, and in fact, the um, National Monument, the Grand Staircase was established in the 1990s after um, Rich Cefeli 
and Jeff Eaton started discovering mammals there. And they were um, from some of the intervals of the Cretaceous that had not yet yielded mammals. And so um, in many ways, the scientific impetus for creating that national monument was things like this little uh, multi-tuberculate tooth, um, which don't necessarily excite the public, but certainly excited um, the paleontological world of the time. And Grand Staircase not only has produced a lot of um, scientific impact, but it's had a lot of cultural impact too. Um, and a few years ago, um, my graduate students and I were talking about um, paleontology in the media and who, who we thought the, the most famous paleontologist might be. Um, and completely to my surprise, all my students said, oh, of course, it's Dr. Scott um, or Scott Sampson, um, who was the, the host of um, Jim Henson's Dinosaur Train um, series, so that a whole generation of kids um, learned about paleontology from Scott Sampson, um, whose scientific work was all at Grand Staircase Escalante. Um, so these monuments um, are, in the case of Grand Staircase, were very established scientific um, paleontological and specifically vertebrate paleontological um, research areas. Um, I often like to make the equivalent that if a physicist um, needs a cyclotron, um, then a paleontologist needs something like um, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument to work in. Um, so let's come back, um, sort of step back from the paleontology for a moment and um, look at what exactly is the National Monument? Um, how did they come to be? What does it do? Um, so um, following up on what I said at the beginning of the talk, um, a National Monument it's a special category of US federal land um, where federal land means um, land that is owned and managed by the, the United States federal government. And it's often referred to as public land. And depending on one's level of cynicism or optimism, um, it's land that belongs to the people of the United States. Um, and national monuments specifically um, under the Antiquities Act exist to protect historical, archaeological, or scientific um, resources. And if you want to think about it this way, um, essentially what a national monument is, um, on the huge tracts of federal land that I'll show you in the next slide, if there is something important in one of these three categories that risks being destroyed by other uses, a president can reserve that land to protect those things, essentially take the land out of public circulation um, to, to preserve those things. And a couple of important points um, that are sort of counteract some of the um, popular resentment about the monuments. Um, these, these monuments were not taken from anyone uh, when they were created. Uh, monuments are established only on existing federal land, um, though occasionally land is purchased um, or traded or gifted to the federal government um, to create a monument. And they are usually proclaimed by US presidents under the Antiquities Act, uh, but they can also be established or altered by US Congress. Um, federal land in the United States, um, if you're not aware of this, a large part of Western North America um, is owned and managed by the U.S. federal government under one of several bureaus, um, Bureau of Land Management being the dominant one, but also the National Park Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the Forest Service, and sometimes the Department of Defense. And the reason that land um, belongs to the federal government has to do with the history of the United States, um, treaties, purchases, um, extirpation of Native Americans, et cetera, um, brought that land under the federal government. And in the East, a lot of it was um, then given to homesteaders, but in the West, a lot of it was reserved um, by the, the federal government and not homesteaded. Um, so in some states like um, Nevada up here, you can see there's very, very little private land, which is the, um, the white, um, and Utah also very little private land, um, also the white areas here. Um, and we'll see in a moment, um, that fact is resented by some people in the West. Um, but those lands were retained often um, either to provide public grazing or because the land was too arid, um, unsuitable for um, other things. So it was retained for mining purposes and, and what have you. Um, so those monuments were reserved out of existing federal land down in this part of, of Utah. Um, so what is distinctive about a national monument as opposed to say a nat national 
Park, uh, which most people are familiar with, or other types of general um, federal land. Um, what's distinctive about it is the uses are restricted. Um, so if you look back here at all of this Bureau of Land Management land, um, that land is available for things like grazing, recreation, mining, petroleum extraction, conservation, scientific research, everything else. It's a multiple use um, philosophy, uh, trying to make the widest use of that land for um, the people of the United States, as a politician might say. Um, national monuments differ in that the uses are restricted, and they are restricted specifically to prioritize whatever the resources were that were named in the proclamation. So if president decides to protect something, um, issues a proclamation saying I'm protecting X, Y, and Z um, in this area, and that status then protects them from damage. Um, it conserves them to maintain and enhance their value, and it facilitates appropriate access to realize their value. And so what is, from a, from a paleontologist's point of view, what is cool about Grand Staircase and Bear's Ears is that the dominant scientific reason they were set aside um, includes paleontology. So if you look at Bill Clinton's proclamation in 1996, Six. He said he was reserving Grand Staircase because of its geological treasures, number one, paleontological sites, number two, archaeological, uh, three, human history and biology, four and five. Um, Bears Ears, when proclaimed by Obama, you may know um, that it, it's very important to the five tribes of the area for cultural um, reasons. And so the primary reason for reserving bears ears was its archaeology and human history, and particularly the, the tribal history. Um, but then secondarily, it's studying geology. And thirdly, um, it's paleontological resources plus night skies and biology. Um, and so that means that paleontology at these monuments is conserved. And conserved doesn't just mean putting up a fence and protecting them. Um, and a good example of what conserving means, this is Fort McHenry National Monument um, in Baltimore, um, that tourists to Baltimore often go see um, the US National Anthem Star Spangled Banner was coined um, after a battle there. So it's reserved as a national monument. Um, and you don't just put up a fence around it um, to keep people out. Um, it's restored. Um, it's kept in good working order. Um, visitors, historians, etc., are encouraged to, to visit, to learn, um, and to make use of that resource. So for paleontology as a resource, um, paleontology, conserving it means studying it. And so at Grand Staircase, which again has a history since 1996, um, one of the, the great scientific achievements there um, comes from the fact that in that monument's management, um, a position was created for a monument paleontologist who is Alan Titus. And many of you um, who are attending may well know Alan. Um, and he his responsibilities are to inventory the paleo there, um, to identify what um, could could be researched. He act proactively um, invites researchers to come um, when they have expertise in something that is um, found there. Um, so he also has funding to deploy to facilitate the research, or he did, um, I should say. Um, and um, it's also part of his mission to 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 get the scientists to synthesize um, what they do. Um, so you see a few uh, pictures here. So the, the funding and the, the activities go all the way from identifying things in the field, um, excavating them, getting them into a prep lab, um, getting them into a collection and studying them, but then also publishing them. Um, so here's the book I referred to before by Titus and, and Lowen, which is a, a synthetic compendium of um, the Kaparowitz Plateau paleontology, um, where he actively tries to get the paleobotanist to talk to the mammal paleontologist to talk to the dinosaur paleontologist and really put everything together. Um, and scientifically, that means I think that um, because it's been a national monument, um, even though research would have been done there anyway, um, it is much more synthetic and much more thorough than it would have been had a national monument not been declared. Um, and here's, here's just one of the examples. You know, this is a wilderness area. Um, and it's difficult to get through, um, but it's very fossiliferous. And this is a Lythronax, uh, either Lythronax or I think it's actually Teratophonius um, skeleton that was excavated way up on the Kaparowitz Plateau, um, had to be helicoptered out to a road to get it 
back to Salt Lake City for preparation um, and funding from the National Monument allows things like these helicopter airlifts to happen. Um, so it's it's been very important for science um, and, and it's the, the monument status um, has been very important for paleontological research um, beyond just simple protection. Um, so coming back to this man in December 4th, um, 2017, he flew out to Utah, went into the state house and announced that he would cut these two national monuments um, by more than half. And there's a little quote from him from that speech on the left, our precious national treasures must be protected. And from now on, they will be protected. And this is how he protected them. Um, this is Bear's Ears. The part that's blacked out is what he cut out of Bear's Ears. Um, and then it's equivalent part of the geological column on the left, X'd out. He basically um, cut out all the Pennsylvanian, a large part of the Permian, um, pretty much all of the, the Cretaceous um, there, as, as well as huge tracts of the, the late Permian and the, the Triassic. Um, so he cut out hundreds, hundreds of sites that we know about. And you know, Bears Ears has not been as well studied because it was only established as a national monument in 2016. Valley of the Gods that I showed you, um, where a lot of the the early um, vertebrate ecosystems were terrestrial vertebrate ecosystems were studied, cut out um, those areas at Indian Creek, um, which is up here that I showed you, cut out um, all sorts of stuff, cut out. Um, Grand Staircase, similar map, black is what was cut out, um, and then the equivalent on the, the, the left in the geological time scale. So all of that Permian, including the type area of, of um, the Kaibab formation, a lot of the Triassic, um, there's just a little bit of it that was left in, um, big chunks of the Kaparowitz Plateau, including all of the um, so-called tropic shale, which is that marine unit that I mentioned, um, and all sorts of type localities um, were cut out. Um, and if you want to see that as a map of sites, um, this is this is Grand Staircase. The white area here is what was retained. The colored area is what was cut out. And each one of those little dots is a, a site that was classified as scientifically important um, and documented in Bureau of Land Management um, database um, with some of the publications on them um, sprinkled around here. Um, these are important sites. And also what is called um, the Bureau of Land Management's paleosensitivity score, which ranges from low to high, which is sort of a formational based um, metric about how much you would expect to find paleontologically in a particular geological formation if you went out to look at it. Um, high is the Kaparowitz Plateau. Um, and if any of you have ever been there, you know how stunning high is because you can more or less stand somewhere and then look around you and start to count the fossils that you can see on the surface. Um, that's high. Um, probably what most of us are familiar with in the terrestrial Cretaceous, um, probably most of it ends up being medium to low because it's so sparse. Um, and you can see by the colors, um, nearly everything that was cut out is in the medium, the high or the medium high category with a little bit of it in the medium. Um, but you can see that nevertheless, there were lots of sites there. Um, so why do these cutouts matter to paleontologists and why did the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology decide to take legal action on them? Um, one, um, the, the society promotes um, protection for paleontological resources around the world, including in the US. And um, there have been a series of successes doing that in the US. And this was really one of the first weakenings of protection for paleontological resources. Um, furthermore, all those areas that were cut out, they were still federal land. They weren't necessarily in physical danger, um, but the fact that they're no longer part of the monument means they don't have the conservation priority anymore. So not eligible for a lot of the funding that would have come, not clearly under the purview of a monument paleontologist um, and et cetera. Um, furthermore, um, this is such an important area that um, by my back of the envelope calculation, there are probably more than 200 Society of Vertebrate Paleontology members that have worked in some capacity at Grand Staircase, whether that's going on a sort of extended scientific field trip or literally doing field work there. Um, and at the time Mr. Trump made his cuts, um, there were at least 27 members who literally had ongoing field projects in the excised area. 
Um, and it's a little hard to count, but um, by my count, there were at least 1400 sites that were cut out, um, which would put them at future risk of destruction from mineral extraction, shale gas, fracking, grazing, off-road vehicle use, et cetera. Um, and not only that, but um, even at Grand Staircase, less than 40% of it had been scientifically inventoried for paleo. And at Bears Ears, only about 5%. And all indications are that with the same amount of effort at Bears Ears, it will be just as paleontologically important. So why did Mr. Trump do this? Um, I'll quickly talk you through some of the, the and this is partly my speculation, um, but put together by, by things that are, that are fairly easily verifiable. Um, one of them probably is personal rivalry. Um, one of those monuments was established by Bill Clinton, the other one by Barack Obama, and it is pretty well known that Mr. Trump disliked and was jealous of and competed particularly with both of those presidents. So chances are good that Mr. Trump himself saw it as an opportunity to thumb his nose at them. Um, another aspect of it um, is, is um, a little bit more subtle kind of politics. Um, Utah is a very conservative state. It's dominantly Mormon, um, particularly in its political structures. And Mr. Trump was not at all popular um, with people in Utah, and particularly people with the Mormon church, um, really because of his morals. Um, I think a lot of people didn't see him as a very good um, person to be in the presidency. And so by comparison, 2008, Mitt Romney was the Republican candidate, got 72% of the vote in Utah. In 2016, Donald Trump got less than half of the vote in Utah. He was still the favorite, but just barely compared to to Hillary Clinton. And so there is, is some reasonable amount of evidence that the Utah delegation, particularly um, Senator Orrin Hatch, saw the opportunity to get monuments cut um, because the Republican Party really needed to make some amends with the, the Utah electorate. And if Trump were to cut those monuments, um, then um, he might regain um, some popularity in Utah. So there's there's some um, reasonable evidence that, that there was a big push by Hatch and others. Um, and here are some things that, that Hatch has said about those monuments. Hatch was against them. He called them things like land grabs, et cetera, even though they technically aren't, um, et cetera. Now, why were those monuments unpopular in Utah? Um, Again, Utah is a state that was, um, as, a, as a state in the U.S., um, has been dominantly Mormon, um, the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if you don't know anything about the history of the Mormon Church, um, it has a long interaction with the United States. Uh, Mormon, Mormonism started in upstate New York, uh, moved to Ohio, moved to Missouri, moved back, et cetera. And one of the reasons Mormons were moving is because they were persecuted. Um, they were um, run out in some sense from New York. Um, in Missouri, where they settled, they were violently run out. Um, and in some other places, they were violently run out and eventually decided to move out west outside the bounds of the United States um, and settle in the middle of the desert. Um, and it was not an easy life there. Um, and that was happening um, in the 1840s, 1860s um, in that area. And soon after they got there, so, so one, there's a, there's a long history um, in, in Mormon church history of um, persecution by the U.S. government or uh, people from the United States. They moved outside the United States, but then um, very soon after that, um, all that territory was annexed by the United States. So they were suddenly back in. Um, and then also um, on top of that is the general um, trend in politics in the United States and now um, seemingly cascading everywhere else in the world of um, fairly um, libertarian anti-government um, politics. And some of you may remember um, also 2016, I think it seems forever ago at this point, um, when a group of people occupied a um, fish and wildlife um, fish and wildlife reserve in Oregon. 
um, the, the Bundy standoff, it was often called, led by Ammon Bundy um, and a bunch of people who occupied that for, for quite a while. Um, one man was killed, um, this guy right here in the center, um, Lavoy Finnicum, um, when he tried to rush through a, a roadblock of the, of the um, police officers that were surrounding that. Um, that, that aspect of Western um, politics also plays into it. Um, and in fact, they're very closely related because um, what most people don't necessarily realize is this man who was shot and part of that um, is actually from Canab, Utah, which is where the Bureau of Land Management um, um, field office that manages Grand Staircase is located. Um, so he's, he's from the Grand Staircase area. Um, and it's interesting to hear him. This, this is this man, Lavoie Finnicum. And this is recorded um, at the time of the Oregon standoff. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of what the attitude of many people but, uh, in the, the West The purpose is. of this is to return the resources of this land or this county back to the, the county, to the citizens of this state and, and to this county in particular. And uh, you, know, you, you need to look at this constitutionally. The federal government has no authority to own and control one third of America's landmass. See, I, I'm a rancher down there in, in Mojave County. They control 90% of the land down there. And they have combined all three ranches of power into one legislative, executive, and judicial. And none of these people are accountable to us, the citizens there. They're not under the power of recall. And so they violate the, the, the letter and the intent of the Constitution by combining all three branches of power without representation. See, um, and that kind of politics, um, especially in Utah, um, it, it doubles with the, the Mormon history. Um, and um, so there are a lot of people who, who simply think the federal government shouldn't be owning land, um, that they have no right to, that um, somehow or the other that land has been taken from them. Um, and you've heard the words there that, that they took that um, wildlife refuge um, in order basically to liberate it and to return it to the people. Now then, on top of that, sort of separate from that aspect of politics, um, there is Native American history, um, where this land literally was taken from them, um, either by the US federal government or by settlers um, or by other um, states, which were then, um, the land was acquired from those states by um, the federal government. Um, and indeed the original impetus for the Bears Ears National Monument started with the five tribes um, that, it, that are in that area in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado surrounding it um, was a proposal put forward by the tribes to create the National Monument. It was in Congress forever and wasn't being acted on. Um, and so Obama, at the end of his administration, decided since Congress wasn't doing anything, he would. Um, and this is a web page from the Utah Dene Pacaya, which is a nonprofit that represents um, those five tribes um, in matters related to bears ears. Um, and so that's um, another another aspect of the of the politics, though certainly is not the one that Mr. Trump um, was responding to. He was responding to the um, to the other kinds of politics. Um, when Mr. Trump cut things, um, he basically um, alluded to um, that he was doing it because there were so many resources that were there that um, ought to be available to people and they were locked up inside these monuments um, with only paleontologists and, and other ne'er-do-wells um, able to work there. Um, so just quickly look through the, the resources that are actually there. Um, you may have if you followed any of the story, you may have seen headlines about it. Of um, the areas were cut to um, free up oil, coal, uranium, etc. Um, this one, a Canadian firm wants to start mining um, in lands that used to be part of Grand Staircase. Interestingly, that firm um, established some claims there. Claimed they were going to do, I think, um, copper mining. Um, drove up their price shares immediately. Sold out, and the company no longer exists. It was clearly a, a ploy. Um, to to make money, not to actually mine. Um, one of, in in Utah itself, one of the the main um, uses that is seen of these monuments is grazing. 
And part of that is tied up to the, the early Mormon settlers who had to eke out a land on, that was not very productive. And so um, the images of, of great grandparents or great great grandparents who had to um, farm on these lands and were able to graze on these lands and now they've been um, reserved from it. Um, one, that's not true. Grazing is still allowed um, on both of those monuments as part of the proclamation. Um, but two, just in a in a non-political sense, it's not a very logical place for grazing. Um, this is um, annual precipitation, um, less than eight inches, where an inch is about 2.5 centimeters. Most of it's arid. Um, grazing is not very good there. And in fact, you have to do all sorts of, of vegetation preparation to, to even get anything that's grazable there. Um, Trump, of course, made a lot of noise about coal. Um, in fact, there is one of the largest coal reserves in the United States there in the Kaparowitz Plateau. Um, it's very deep, it's very remote, it's not very economically viable. And despite Trump um, uh, pretending that that's why he was cutting the monument, um, this map here is showing um, where the biggest concentrations of coal are. Most of it, Mr. Trump left in the monument, though he didn't advertise that fact. Um, there's uranium there. In fact, uranium was was mined a lot in the past, um, particularly kind of at the height of the Cold War um, here in the Circle Cliffs um, area and a few other places. Um, so the Chin Lee Formation and the um, the Morrison Formation both um, produce a lot of uranium um, that that uranium had had either played out or become not economically viable before the the monument was established. So there were not any um, active mines. Um, not really part of the, the media discussion, um, but probably the, the, the thing that's most valuable there are rare earth elements, uh, which are going to be important in the, the coming decades for things like uh, electric cars and phones and electronics and everything else. Um, these areas are potentially a source for them. Um, but for the most part, there really isn't um, currently anything that's very valuable there, certainly not compared to the scientific or wilderness values or the, the tribal cultural values. So what happened? Um, we filed suits. Um, they went to um, the district court in Washington, D.C., which essentially is a court that hears matters relating to the entire country. And they were assigned to um, this judge, Tanya Chutkin, um, who oversaw the, the beginning of these cases. Um, in Society of Vertebrate Paleontology is not uh, have any legal experience, um, nor do we have any pockets to pay for legal help. And so the legal help um, that we got is being provided pro bono or free um, by two law firms, one of them um, representing us on Bears Ears, this one Hogan Lovells. Um, these are some of the the people who represented us, um, Hillary Tompkins there, former solicitor for the U.S. De Department of Interior under Obama, um, Adam Kushner, and major environmental law person, um, et cetera. And our co-plaintiffs there include Utah Denebakaya, the, the tribal nonprofit, um, Patagonia, um, the, the outfitter, um, plus some local groups that are, that are interested in the resources there, including the Friends of Cedar Mesa an access fund which promotes hiking. Um, at Grand Staircase Escalante, represented by the Covington and Burling um, team, uh, who you see here with some of the SVP members um, visiting them. Um, also a very high powered law firm, um, Gary Guzzi there in the middle um, was general counsel for the White House. Um, he was general counsel for the EPA under the Obama administration, or at General Counsel of the EPA under Clinton and White House Counsel under the Obama administration. Um, these are major law firms, some of the best um, in North America for environmental law. Um, and they provided the service um, free, um, remembering that we started in 2017 and roughly August of that year. Um, Covington and Burling for one of the groups um, made a calculation of how much it would have cost had we had to pay them for those hours. And in 2017, between August and December, it would have been $1.2 million that we would have owed them. And happily, they've continued to work with us through 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and now um, a large part of 2022. Um, so we've, we've benefited from their assistance. And in fact, that same law firm, you may um, well in Alberta have been aware of the case in Montana where um, a court ruled that um, fossils were part of mineral estate 
um, that firm represented the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology in um, a sort of informal intervention to that case, um, making the point that that they were not and there were potential harms uh, from that ruling, which was eventually overturned. Um, and that was a side benefit to paleontology for um, having a relationship with, with those people. So to round this back up, um, coming back to what our um, cases were, um, when Donald Trump cut these, what he said was that the Antiquities Act, he, he pointed to some wording in the Antiquities Act that monuments can only, they must be limited to the smallest area compatible with the proper care and management of the object to be protected. And he asserted that um, those ought, they were too big. And so he needed to cut them down to their proper size to protect um, the objects. And I've already showed you um, what he excluded, and they were clearly objects that were protected by the the, the proclamations. Um, he also then said, kind of in contradiction, plus those things that I am excluding are now protected by other legislation, like Paleontological Resources Preservation Act, plus they're not important anyway, is essentially what his argument was. Our legal argument was that the Antiquities Act simply doesn't give the president authority to remove protection, period. And furthermore, in the smallest area compatible argument, um, that those areas that he excluded are full of the resources that are supposed to be protected. Um, and they would in fact be less protected. And furthermore, the legislation that he pointed to doesn't offer the same level of conservation as a national monument status does. So we filed those lawsuits on the same day. Um, and this is sort of an abbreviated timeline of everything that has happened, um, starting in 2017 when um, Alan Titus alerted um, the researchers there that there might be um, a review and cuts. Um, Trump issued a, a review, um, so there was a little bit of lead time before he actually made the cuts, and that's when uh, we started um, trying to find partners to to resist it and eventually got invited to be the plaintiff on the lawsuits. Um, then in 2018, there was a whole bunch of um, legal machinations. The Department of Justice representing the president asked to transfer the cases to Utah, where they probably would have had a better chance of winning. Um, Judge Chutkin denied that. Um, the American Farm Bureau in the state of Utah intervened. Um, there were mining claims staked, so on and so on and so on. Um, then there were um, arguments made mostly in written form, primarily in written form, responses, et cetera. And by the end of 2019, essentially all the papers were sitting in front of the judge. And for whatever reason, from the end of 2019 to the present, the judge did not rule, chose not to rule, and we don't really know why. Um, so, in, so we hung around for a while. And then in 2020, there was the election, and then after um, the famous assault on the U.S. Capitol to stop the um, election, uh, nevertheless, President Biden was um, elected, and on his first day in office, he issued um, a an order to, to review Trump's cuts. And um, so at that point, we put the cases in stay. They're still in the courts, um, but they're currently um, essentially on hold to see what the Biden administration does. Um, and I used to ask myself, um, how would I know when we had succeeded? Um, and during the Trump administration, I assume I would know when we had succeeded, when there was an angry um, tweet from the White House because we had won the cases, something like, hypothetically, House Republicans should outlaw dinosaurs. P. David Pauly and his thugs are threatening energy and jobs. Very stupid. But of course, um, he was banned from Twitter and then from the White House. So that never happened, which is a mild disappointment, but only a mild one. Um, but it's been a long haul. Um, and here, the fourth declaration of David Pauly, um, a lot of legal documents filed, um, testifying in Congress, uh, me with Diabloceratops. This is the, um, the Honorable Mr. Pollock, who's the um, county commissioner of one of the counties there, um, and a serious BLM employee there in the back looking on. Um, why did Chutkin not rule? We don't know, um, other than she was busy with a lot of stuff with the Trump administration. Um, so um, blocking the Trump administration's um, things on the U.S. census and the the famous Russian spy and um, things on the, the border um, and et cetera. Um, there were potentially a lot of things that were more important on her docket than, than paleontology. So Biden came in, 
issued his order to review. Um, Deb Holland, um, herself a Native American and not far from these um, areas, appointed Secretary of State, visited Utah, made a recommendation to the White House, and then on October 21st of last year, um, there were orders signed restoring the monuments. Um, and that's kind of where things sit. Um, we're waiting to see kind of what happens. The cases are still in stay, um, but there's a lot of stuff going on and it's not clear exactly what the legal path forward is. Um, so that's, I'll more or less stop there, but if you're interested in learning more about um, Grand Staircase, um, the book here on the left where dinosaurs are owned by Krista Sadler is written for a general audience, but it's detailed enough to be interest um, to a professional paleontologist about Grand Staircase, and then the book I mentioned before um, about the Kaparowitz by Alan Titus and Mark Lowen, which is a compendium of, of many authors. Um, and I'll just leave this up here for a second, all the people who have helped on this. Um, and as Jeff said at the introduction, um, I normally work on Cenozoic mammals. I had very little familiarity with anything um, about this when this started, and an awful lot of people have educated me, supported me, um, as well as the plaintiff partners and the legal teams. So thank you very much. And I guess we are happy to take questions through the chat and question and answer. Thank you very much indeed. David. I, I always felt about this, that this was kind of like a tale of two presidents, you know, it's uh, poly v Trump, mono e mono. And uh, having said that, I, I remember when this kicked off, because I, I was pretty new on government affairs committee of SVP at the time that we were starting to get all these documents through and seeing briefing us on what was happening and going over and doing all the, all the wording and everything it was such a dry experience and to 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 um, hear and see you present it such a vivid uh, picture just now with all the color and all the aspects of um, uh, the history and the commercial aspects it was, it was absolutely um, fascinating so I'm, uh, I'm i'm really pleased that you were able to do that for us uh, in in long form although i could tell that you were kind of compressing it just a, a little bit um I want to even see. even in the dry doc legal documents, there were sometimes some pretty funny things. No, no, I, <laughs> I can believe yes, that. If, you, if you'd give me another hour, I could have bored you with those. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I wasn't quite fast enough to take a screen capture of the um, the, the pseudo tweet that you put up at the end because I think that would have been really good on Twitter. But uh, anyway. Um, yeah, so I was uh, going. We are um, open to uh, if anybody uh, has any questions. I mean, the I, I guess that Tanya um, uh, Chutkin. I mean, as you said, she's she's obviously have had uh, um, no shortage of things to do, um, especially to do with, um, with with Trump and there's one or two particularly well quoted rulings recently. So, um, do you, do you foresee a time? In, in your heart of hearts where her workload is going to drop down that is she's going to do something about it what's your your well, sense at, of at that? the moment they're formally on stay so um she she isn't supposed to do anything about them right now and um the there's some talk going on right now about maybe settling them because um, it's not clear whether it's a good idea to keep them active or not and the legal teams and all of the plaintiffs um, and I, I didn't say that there are not only is svp involved in two different suits but then for each one of those monuments there's several parallel suits that are all um, coordinated at some level um, and there's a lot of talk about whether it's useful to keep them going and there are some arguments why it might be so if if utah objects to biden's um enlargement of them having those cases still active in washington dc may be um, ammunition for transferring cases that are filed in utah to washington which would um, probably be um, better for the paleontology aspect um, but other other reasons why it may just be a waste of time to have them at this point so that's still being debated so i i doubt we will get a ruling on it it does seem slightly, uh, something of a shame because, you know, in an extent, it sort of focused so much on, well, does the president have the right to revisit these things? And just a sort of a, a clear judgment on that would have been really helpful. And yes, hang unresolved is, is kind of unsatisfactory. Yeah. Um, I see some questions here. Yeah, uh, I've got one actually that I want to flag up quickly from which uh, uh, Patty sent in. Um, okay. Do we actually know who chose the areas to be cut? Because, you know, presumably it wasn't Trump Sharpie coming out again. So uh, it seems it's a little a bit really random. It's a really interesting question. And 
And at some level, I don't know. I know a few factoids about it, um, but I have studied those maps and indeed originally used GIS to put them to put them in to, to really trace what was there. Um, Grand Staircase, the new boundaries were defined fairly intelligently. So sometimes they would loop around you know, a major paleo site, which would just be kept in um, the boundary, um, which showed some, some intelligence at work. Um, and I suspect, I think I know what happened was that sort of in piece by piece, um, sections of Grand Staircase were handed to different um, experts and said, are there important things here, yes or no? Um, and then that was taken back and a decision was made somewhere else. Um, but at Bears Ears, um, there's a lot more indication that it may have been Mr. Trump or somebody else's Sharpie because they, they just go through funny places. In fact, there was a, a little corner that he added to the monument that had previously been in Bears Ears and there's no logical reason why it ought to have been added, um, but it was. And so there's very, very little care there. Yeah, so it's nothing to do with a hurricane making landfall there. The team. Maybe, don't know. <laughs> it's going to, I mean, it's, it is uh, uh, kind of fascinating. Uh, one question uh, Peggy was asking was, um, mm -hmm. what's the status of paleontological work in the monuments as this case has been wending its way through the courts? Um, it has continued. Um, and of course, it's still federal land. The, the scientists still have, have permits. Um, the ways in which it may that, that it's been impacted, or, and I should also say, um, there also ended up being a long legal process. So even when Trump made his cuts, legally everything was supposed to still be managed the same way until there was a new planning process, and that went through pretty quick in terms of federal land planning processes. But it still took almost a year, um, and in that period, nothing changed. Um, technically, but what has really changed is a whole lot of funding has been cut back. Um, and not only the funding that would have been, a, that was just literally due to the cuts, but the Trump administration cut a huge amount of funding to scientific research um, on federal lands across the board. So that's been an impact. Um, but otherwise people have still tried to plug away. Um, and what has not happened really is it bears ears. One would have expected a monument paleontologists to have been put in place to do all the things that Alan Titus does at Grand Staircase, and that still never happened. Um, so in some ways, um, the, the, the ramp up in research that would have been expected hasn't happened. Okay, I think this uh, answer slightly uh, echoed uh, one of Clinton's uh, um, questions um, uh, about the direct funding um, and how that was inhibited. And I, and I can say that there were, there were at least a couple of cases where somebody was not going for you know, national research council funding like national science foundation but other sources and a couple of people um the the funding sources pulled out because of the uncertainty so they lost funding that they thought they'd been awarded yeah clinton also asked about the 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 boundaries why are they irregular um at grand staircase i can kind of answer that um, some of them do follow a little bit of logic. Um, sometimes they're steering around some resource. Um, sometimes they're following a road, um, et cetera. Um, and so there are presumably a whole, whole lot of fine scale decisions that were made. Um, bears ears, I have no idea. I do think it was a Sharpie. Yeah. I just guess there might be a couple of really interesting maps still in those boxes at Mar-a-Lago, but we'll see perhaps one day. Um, Darius asks, uh, were uh, Grand Staircase and Bears Years the only national monuments that Donald Trump decided to cut? Um, they were the only national monuments that he did cut. Um, he, he, when he authorized the the review of them, he authorized the review for every monument since 1996. Probably no coincidence, that's the year that Grand Staircase was, that were over a certain size. And there were 25 or something that fell into that category, um, almost all of which had paleo resources. And um, the Department of Interior, then under Ryan Zinke, recommended a whole bunch of them to be cut. Um, but Trump only cut the two. And hence, hence my supposition that he was only interested in thumbing his nose at Clinton and Obama. I think he lost interest after that. 
Um, no thyrhynchus on the list of fauna that have been found in the area. Has there been any other evidence of any other therizinosaur species found in the area? Um, I'm not really the person to answer that. Um, probably some other people in the audience could answer it better. Um, that Nothrinchus is a pretty exceptional specimen. If I'm remembering right, it may even be in a marine deposit, like it washed out. Um, I think it is the only Therizinosaur known there. There may, may or may not be some other scraps, but it's the main evidence as far as I know. If anybody else knows, maybe they can throw something into the Q&A. What about theft by the public? How is that handled? Um, at Bears Ears, um, particularly in the southern area, or actually all over Bears Ears, um, theft has been a major issue. And one of the reasons why there's such a push, especially by SVP, to have a monument created there to put more resources into it. Um, technically, it's handled um, by federal government. It is theft from from the federal government, which means um, entities like um, the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation may be involved, uh, but usually public lands, they do have their own law enforcement. Um, it's usually pretty light in most areas. It's, it's usually um, beefed up a bit where there's special resources like at a national monument. And that ought to have been one of the benefits of the national monument, but I don't think it's increased a whole lot at this point. And to some extent, we only know anecdotes about what may have been stolen or damaged there. It sort of takes somebody discovering it. There was a really spectacularly um, wonderful um, example right at the time this started. Um, people working in Bears Ears had found um, a phytosaur, I believe it is um, skeleton that was almost complete, but it was clear that the skull had been taken out sometime in the past. Um, it, it wasn't there. There was a bit of, of clear disturbance and, and the little tip of the snout was still there, but the rest of the skull was missing. And they'd prepared a, a poster for SVP uh, about that theft. Um, meanwhile, at um, Petrified National Forest in Arizona, um, somebody came to visit and saw all the um, educational things about um, fossils from public lands. It's illegal to have them, especially vertebrate fossils, and learned their importance. And somebody came and turned in a phytosaur skull. And the guy there prepared an SVT poster about this wonderful uh, thing. And they were both in the same area in the same sort of poster session. And they got to looking and discovered that the skull that was turned in was the one that was built for, for Bears Ears. Uh, but, it, but it sometimes takes remarkable coincidences like that to really identify things where they've gone and what's happened to them when they're discovered to be. It's a good lesson to us all to, you know, check all those posters when you go to the poster sessions. It's not just for the free coffee. Um, yeah, so I, I, I suppose that um, also with that, that reflects in terms of the theft, as, as you kind of alluded to just now, your slide earlier talking about the disparity of the audits between the, the, the two monuments in terms of how many of the paleontological resources had been fully audited in the area. And of course, if that's only like 5% complete or whatever, then your chances of noticing uh, that anything's missing is really negligible, except of course, for the situation where there's a skull shaped hole where a skull should be, that's a, that's a big clue. But, um, but yes, it does sort of um, underline the whole importance of um, having uh, qualified paid uh, paleontologists on site as part of the staff to be able to uh, take care of the resources and know what's there um, uh, as a starting point. Um, Incidentally, I see in the, the attendee list, um, Amy Heinrichy and, and Rebecca Hunt Foster, two of the people there in my acknowledgement slides who helped, helped coach me on all sorts of issues or um, helped me collect data. So thank you, both of you. We have, let me just scroll down and see if there's any. Um, Okay, fair point is uh, Clinton, oh. I think coming back there, uh, are there any monuments that have been 100% inventoried? I don't know. Um, there are lots and lots of national monuments, um, some of which don't have paleo in their, um, in their uh, mission. Um, let me think, um, Agate Springs, Agate Springs, I think Agate Springs, Agate anyway, Agate Fossil Beds in 
Nebraska is pretty small and it is primarily paleontological. I would bet it has been pretty well inventoried, um, but I think most of them are probably so big and the number of paleontologists available for inventory is so small that I would doubt and it would be called 100% inventory. Okay, that's a, that's a fair reflection. Recent and new uh, discoveries, yes, and I haven't even been able to keep up with them, but um, the, the most recent, most spectacular discovery or um, report, and of course it's paleontology, so there's an awful lot that has to be done between the time something is discovered in the ground and by the time it's really synthesized and published. But last year, late last year, um, the so-called Rainbows and Unicorns site at the Kaparowitz Plateau, which has, I can't remember, is like five or six, I think it was Lythronax and maybe a couple of other Tyrannosaurs all um, all there together. Um, it's just really a spectacular site. It's one of those where you step out and you just look and see the fossils all around you. Um, that one was published last fall by Alan Titus and, and quite a few collaborators and got a lot of press because the press picked it up as um, evidence that, that these Tyrannosaurus hunted in packs, which was not necessarily the main thrust of the paper, but it, it got press that way. So yes, there's, there's st stuff being worked on all the time from these places. Yeah, then, uh, uh, um, comes in to say hi and happy to help, uh, yeah. which, is a, which is a nice touch. Yeah, no, it's uh, Clinton makes a, a, a very valid point uh, that uh, perhaps if somebody named a dinosaur after Trump, you'd be more sympathetic. Uh, uh, interesting. Interestingly, when when Ryan Zinke, the Secretary of the Interior, recommended that Grand Stair Staircase be cut, he had it displayed in his office a Lythronax skull. Um, a, a cast of the Lythronax um, skull from Grand Staircase. So maybe maybe it would make him more sympathetic or maybe not. It would have to be a large therapod, of course. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's any more questions, is there anything else that you'd like to, to comment on? I'm, I know there's been something, some stuff recently about uh, some... Uh, issues also in, in Utah, I believe, uh, with uh, trackways or anything. Yeah, um, there is the, the now quite okay. infamous Mill Canyon um, trackway that um, the Moab office, which is one of the offices that <coughs> manages Bears Ears, um, which um, most of the people that are there, um, I, I think, you know, their paleontological expertise at this point is, is zero. They um, their last paleontologist um, went to a better job and they have not replaced that position, even though it was funded for a paleontologist. Um, they commissioned some work um, at that site and somebody who was doing the work drove over the trackway with heavy equipment. Um, so yes, that is, that is going on and it certainly doesn't create a sense that that office will be managing Bears Ears very well. Um, but it also plays into the the politics, the, the person who on Twitter who did the most to expose that that had happened is somebody who has been the former chair of the Republican Party in Utah and who is very against all federal management and would like to see the Bureau of Land Management out. And so um, one, of, one of the motivations for exposing it is to, to make the argument that the Bureau isn't capable of managing, which is not, not what I think ought to happen as a result. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty egregious situation. It's interesting politics for public lands in the U.S. and I suspect in Canada too. I, I mean, I, I think it's it's fascinating. It's um, in terms of the, the the whole. We we talk about the interface between money and politics and paleontology and um, how how dark it can get. Uh, but this sort of crystallizes so many aspects of that, and you know. In some ways, when you you get to the point that um, uh, sorry, that's my six month old. Um, when you get to the point that uh, actually it wasn't the commercial interests after all, it was it was it was more about petty spite. It's kind of like it's it's yeah. kind of disappointing in a strange way. Yeah, I, I I've never gotten the sense that major commercial interests were were the impetus behind this. It's more of the, the politics that one has seen played out in the Trump administration and post-Trump administration. And again, now in Canada. 
Yeah. Well, I think with that, uh, I'd like once again to, to thank David Polly. Um, I hope these things aren't uh, too traumatic because I realize this was kind of like a bombshell that landed in the middle of your presidency of SVP and uh, uh, I, I would suspect dominated it to a, a large extent. And obviously it's still sort of persisting uh, a little bit. But yeah. um, I have to say there have been some good things about it. I think one, it, it really united yeah. the society. Um, I learned an awful lot. Um, I know all sorts of things about Mesozoic paleontology that I didn't know before and all sorts of things about public land law. So. It did, but that's okay. That's all. It's all growing exercises for all of us. So um, I think, unless there's one last question that's crept in there, uh, it's just uh, um, and Peggy was also wanting to thank you for a uh, very informative talk. Um, thank you I all. I think it's a very satisfied audience. And uh, thanks again for your time today, David, and your uh, wonderful insight and the inside track of uh, this experience. Um, and uh, Hopefully, um, uh, we'll see some of you back next week, or if not all of you, for next week's uh, speaker, who will be Daniel Paula from the University of Florida, dealing with hyper ossification and tooth loss in living and fossil frogs, and probably with less ultrasonic babies in the background next week. Um, but thanks again uh, for your time, David, and we'll uh, hopefully see you all next week. Thanks. Bye, everybody.